Congressman, welcome back to the program here. The House is back at work. New Speaker Mike Johnson asked Congress for $14.5 billion for Israel, but he wanted that money to come out of another place in the budget. What do you think about that? I think that's, that, that's the correct way to go about this. This stuff needs to be paid for, and there's $300 billion that's been set aside since COVID that needs to be uh, needs to be drawn from to pay for this. Uh, it's been sitting there for a long time. So is COVID money would pay for Israel rather than some the, other the kind of money? There's, there's various funds that it's coming from, but there's $300 billion that has been sitting in an account uh, waiting to be spent. And I think that this is the perfect place to come, uh, take it out of. Uh, additionally, it's going to uh, replenish our stocks that, uh, that we are sending over there. We're sending Iron Dome to Israel. Uh, our best friend in, in the Middle East needs to be taken care of. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we lost three weeks uh, looking for a new speaker. So it's time to act. The Pentagon says money for Ukraine is running low as well. Republicans wanted to separate Israel from Ukraine spending. Um, I, I'm curious whether you think that's a mistake. I think it's a question of all the priorities that we must attack right now within the, the world view of what's going on in, in the entire world, we must remember that the, the border for the House Republicans is the number one issue. Protection of American citizens, stopping the flow of fentanyl, stopping terrorists coming through our, our borders right. that we know that, that are there. And so we need to make sure that the Senate and the, the White House understands that that's our number one priority and anything else must flow after that. So it's not that, that there is widespread uh, 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 animosity towards Ukraine aid, but we haven't seen the activity necessary for the border that we want to see. Now, remember, when I talk to people about Ukraine and the border, we're not talking about money at, at the border. It's not a zero-sum game on money going to Ukraine, money going to Israel, and money going to the border. It is a policy outlook on the border that must be addressed by this administration. So we're going to be looking at that, but also Ukraine is a couple of months away from running out of everything that they need. Right. And, uh, and so they need help as well. They, uh, they have ground down 50% of the Russian uh, military capacity in this last year and a half of war. And they're fighting for their own sovereignty. But at the same time, Israel is now looking at a potential three uh, front war and, uh, and widening war within the Middle East, all based on uh, Iran's goals throughout the world. So, uh, and, and keep in mind that the Central and South American nations are also starting to get closer to Iran. So th this is all linked together. There's no one isolated threat here. Well, as far as Ukraine goes, some in your party would rather reduce money for Ukraine. Do you think that's a good idea? Well, remember when we talk about Ukraine, it's, it's far more complicated than what you might see on a tweet and money going to Ukraine. It's weapons, it is sustainability for Human, uh, human, taking care of human beings, and it's also replenishing our stocks that we not, might need anywhere else in the world. So n you can't bury your head and think that we can just ignore these issues when they come up. And the world is a much different place than it was a year and a half ago, and even worse, it's much different than it was uh, on October 6th, uh, right before Hamas uh, conducted uh, a Holocaust attempt on the Israeli people. Let me ask you about the Israeli response. Uh, Israel has cut off food, water, and electricity. The United Nations says that Israel is violating international humanitarian law um, and says that 8,000 people have died, mostly women and children. Is Israel respecting humanitarian law as far as you can tell? There's a lot wrapped up in that question, Jason. Anything that the United Nations says where two uh, permanent members of the Security Council are, are both interested in genocide around the world, Russia's conducting a genocide against the Ukrainian people, and that's how I address that conflict right there. That is a genocide, not a conflict. But, but Stalin did this in the 30s, and, and then uh, China is conducting genocide on the Uyghur people. So I'll get to the answer here in just a yeah. second. But anything that the UN says is based on an anti-Semitic view that they've had for decades. And now we're seeing that manifest itself in the Secretary of the General of the UN saying, but, but wait, look out for the people of Gaza. The, the Israelis have said, flee to the south. We're going to take out these tunnel networks. And I went to Israel uh, several months ago uh, with, with a large group of congressmen, and we saw these tunnels. And the Hamas has been running Gaza since 2005 when Israel unilaterally pulled out and the Gaza people elected Hamas as their, uh, as their leadership. And then they started using them as human shields. They put, uh, they put rockets in hospitals and homes. The atrocities committed by Hamas, uh, which are proxies for Iran, 
uh, are absolutely atrocious and they've been compared to ISIS, they're far worse than ISIS. So uh, Israel is doing everything that they can to make sure that civilians leave and the, uh, the, the, the rightful uh, military targets against these terrorists are taken out. 8,000 women and children dead in Gaza though. Sh should Israel be targeting more specifically military targets? The, the numbers that we're getting are coming from the Hamas government. Right. So if you think the that they're going to tell the, the health ministry of Hamas, I, is, it, that would be like us listening to uh, the dictators of, of Iraq and Germany in World War II telling us how many people are killed. I don't believe that, that number for a second. Don't, you don't buy the numbers. And, and they use human shields at their military targets. So I don't believe it, a thing that Hamas says. They are not, they've proven themselves not to be trustworthy and a terrorist group. So why would we listen to their spokespeople? November 17th, when the government runs out of money, Speaker Johnson said he doesn't like stop gaps or, or band-aids or continuing resolutions. What's going to happen? Because that clock is ticking right now. Clock's ticking. We are going to pass three appropriations bills, uh, transportation, housing, urban, de urban development, interior, and the legislative branch, which funds Congress this week. And of course, uh, for some time now, we've talked about spending bills that might go through January 15th or April 15th, as he just took over this last week, we're gonna have to flesh that out and see how long those, those short-term spending bills last. But we're, we're on the job trying to pass these appropriations bills and then send them over the Senate. So we don't get jammed by the Senate. Remember, the Senate's priorities and the administration's priorities are different than those of the House, and all spending bills start in the House. So we're gonna pick that up, pick that ball up, and, and pass those uh, starting this week. Do you expect the government will shut down November 17th? I do not. I do, I, and and, and uh, uh, Speaker Johnson and, and just about everybody in the conference has said we, we understand that we've lost three weeks and we need to keep the government funded while we pass these appropriations bills. And remember, when I voted for that, that uh, spending bill on September 30th, little did we know that October 7th would happen. Payday for our troops begins on October 13th. If we hadn't passed that, the troops would not get paid. Their families back at home with extremely high costs would not have been able to pay the rent, buy their groceries, buy diapers, buy formula, buy gasoline for their cars. And uh, so we keep, need to keep that in mind when we talk about shutting down the government. The troops don't get paid, and now they're sitting in two aircraft carriers in their battle groups off the coast of Israel. So we always need to keep that in mind, what happens in a shutdown. Congressman, House Republicans have finally united around Mike Johnson for speaker. I'm curious, uh, how united is the party right now, several days after Mike Johnson has taken the gavel? All members of the Republican conference present voted for Mike Johnson. Uh, as this process was playing itself out, uh, sometimes the word chaos was used. Remember, eight people on the Republican side joined with all 208 Democrats to catch the car. When they caught the car, they bit the driver and didn't have anywhere else to go while the house was on fire. Uh, so. They left us with no plan B. So it's remarkable that in three short weeks, relatively, we, went, uh, we found somebody unanimously on, on the Republican side who lowers the temperature in the room. He is a concerted conservative. He's a good man. And everybody has a great deal of respect for Mike Johnson. And as I said before, he brings the temperature down. And he's a very smart guy. He knows the Constitution forward and backward. And he's the right guy for these very tense times to lower the temperature in the room and, and move us forward. The temperature does need to be lower, but how united are you around your colleagues and your colleagues around you and others? I think it was somewhat surprising when in the conference meeting, everybody got up and st said Mike Johnson. Some people had been missing because they thought that this wasn't gonna resolve itself, but it did. And we united about my, around Mike Johnson. And remember, when we talk about the Speaker of the House, job number one, if you're gonna be the Speaker, is to protect your majority. Job number two is to broaden that majority. And when you can get everybody from this very different, uh, robust group of people to unite around one candidate, that's remarkable. But I always had hope that that would happen anyway. So we, we like where we're, the starting point that we have now, recognizing we've lost a lot of time. The American people are understandably upset that we haven't been working on their behalf. So we have to get to work now. So Wednesday is going to be a very busy day. You're one of uh, three Republicans who voted against Jim Jordan. You said he wasn't the right person for the speaker's job. Do you think that will impact you in re-election in March, four and a half months from now? It might, it might not. I think that people are starting to come to the realization that Mike Johnson is the right guy for the job, and I was very proud to vote for him. And, and so I think that that'll, that'll work itself out as we go along. If he's an effective speaker and, and, and people believe that, that, uh, that, that we were right on picking him, then I think that'll, that'll work itself out. But I understand. Most people are very upset in a time of high inflation, a border that's wide open, 
worldwide conflict emerging all over the place and we're not able to get our jobs done, there was understandable anger that we just didn't get somebody. But as I've often said, you have to get the right man, not a man right now. That's a good one. Good line. Mike Pence dropped out of the race. Trump still leads the uh, polls for Republican primary voters. Super Tuesday, four months away. Who are you going to back? Time is, time is ticking away, and, and this is a long process. So I'm not uh, backing anybody at this point, but we have to make sure that we get the White House, the Senate, and grow our majority in the House uh, moving forward to, to address our conservative agenda to protect the people of the United States. As I said, from the congressional perspective, especially Texas House Republicans, the border is job one. When you are losing wartime numbers, 290 Americans every day to fentanyl and drug overdose, we lost 305 Americans every day in World War II. We're losing wartime numbers of American people in our bedrooms and our backyards. That is no longer acceptable. We have to address that, not to mention human trafficking and terrorists crossing our border. So we have to address that first. And if the president is not going to address it, we have to replace him with somebody who will. And I know both of those candidates, all three of those candidates, recognize the importance of the border, as does the new Speaker of the House. When will you get in the race? When will you endorse somebody for president? Oh, well, that's a good question. I haven't, I haven't been ans asked that, and we've been thinking about appropriations bills, and as an appropriator, that's been my priority for, for now anyway. All right. Congressman, thanks so much for the time. Thank you very much, Jason. Good to see you.